Yeah, I'll let them in. Yep. Yeah, okay. Okay, and we should be, we are recording. Great, thank you. Um, so let's get started um, for the um, solar working bylaw, um, uh, solar bylaw working group uh, meeting of <clears throat> Friday, January 6th, 2023. Um, and thank you everybody for rejoining um, and hope everybody had nice holidays, a restful break um, and uh, some rejuvenation uh revigoration for the uh, for the coming year sure. uh, so happy 2023 everybody um hope everybody's well uh let's get uh get started um i think first order of business is to um, all right Okay, did the people just hear that? No. Okay, no. You, you didn't, okay. There's like, um, my building at UMass is, uh, is somewhat under construction. Uh, oh. So I haven't heard, <laughs> or re reconstruction, I should say. Um, though, and I've heard that noise uh, many, many weeks ago, but it's the first I've heard it in the last few days, but like they like drill, drilling through cement somewhere in this one of the ceilings or something. So. It, it, it lasted just for a second. I couldn't hear anything. Um, I'm surprised you didn't hear anything, but if that happens again, I'll, there it goes. Okay, a little bit. Hopefully it won't uh, persist. Sorry. We're not hearing it. Okay. I'm not sure why it's really loud. <laughs> okay. Um, anyhow, so my first order of business was to um, uh, ask for the, uh, the, the minute taker. Um, and first... Mm -hmm. It. We can hear it, but it's very faint. Yeah. So it's not bothering me. I, I can't hear. I don't know. If, I I can't hear any drilling, but I can't hear Dwayne. Or did you just stop talking? I stopped talking because the drilling. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> this is a bad beginning for the year. Seriously. Yeah. Because I, I can't hear. I can't hear myself speak when I that drilling happens. It's like in the floor underneath me, I think, but hopefully it's just, it's not going to, it's going to go away. Um, but anyhow, uh, I thank you. Um, I think it was Janet who took the meetings last, the minutes last time. Um, I think it was Martha. I, no, Martha. no, it was Janet. No, Martha, Martha, we have, do have minutes to approve from Martha yeah. I think two meetings yeah. ago, yeah. Uh, if I recall. And then Janet, um, we still need, need, uh, the minutes from you um yes get to those next meeting i'll uh, get them out next week i've been working on them okay. okay great and then um uh but then that it does look like laura's on tap today but i think she's in the car uh, <laughs> uh somewhere between new york city and here <laughs> so, um, if, I, if someone could switch with me that would be great i'm actually on the train and then the train will be in the car in about 10 minutes Oh. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. I wouldn't. Uh, it's enough to be uh, uh, <laughs> to be driving while on the cell phone. I wouldn't want anybody taking minutes <laughs> while driving. So um, I do wonder if um, uh, it does bring us back to uh, um, Bob. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you're so willing. Thank you. Great. And I'll make note of that. <sighs> Right, great. Um, okay. Um, so then, um, thank you, uh, Stephanie, for getting us prepared with the uh, meeting packet and so forth uh, and the agenda. Um, first order of business would be to review um, and and vote if we're um, want to go forward on the uh, meeting on the minutes from um, December second meeting. Um, which were in our packet. Um, didn't have a long time to review them, but I looked at them this morning. Um, and I'm wondering if people have any comments or, or edits to offer on those minutes. Yeah, I, I didn't get a chance to look at them, but I'm sure they're good. But 
probably should read them. Do you yeah. want me to? I could display them, Dwayne, and just sort of scroll through them quickly. If that would make people uh, comfortable, for sure. Um, and uh, and then if we are comfortable voting on them, that would be great. If not, we can um, table it for the next meeting as well. Yeah, yeah, because that was the uh, I did the minutes, and that was when we had the representative from KP Law. Yeah. I had I went through the you know listened to the recording and tried to be pretty faithful in recording everybody's comments, but I think it is important that people look at the the minutes and and feel comfortable. Like Jack, I quoted you a couple of times on and uh, uh, so on. I think it would be good for people to just look and make sure that they're comfortable with how I quoted them. <laughs> Okay. I like. Can you them. all see them now? I I had missed the meeting, but watched it, and I thought this these were a good set of minutes. Yeah, they've, yeah, all, been, I, they've all been good. Yeah, I would concur with that, and and uh, I I would agree with Martha that these minutes are a good record of that conversation that we would might want to revisit as time goes on, uh, and we get into these issues, uh, but also um, obviously the written responses from the KP Laura in our in our uh, packet as well. Not today's packet, but a previous packet. I have a minor revision just about my title. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yep. Yeah, you're do you're director rather than coordinator, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry. I think I copied it from a you know minutes. No worries. Free promotion. Oh, no minutes. worries at all. Sorry. Um, that's okay. No worries. And I know you won't be able to read sort of everything, but just to sort of get a sense of what was captured here. Okay, just as you do that, I'm going to actually move myself physically to another room in my office suite here, which I think will be further away from this drilling. Yeah.
Dwayne, are you back with us now? Yes, I, I am. Yep, sorry. Yep, okay, great. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. Great. So um, any comments or though on those um, or any proposal to um, e either accept the minutes or to um, postpone discussion of the minutes and approval of the minutes until next time if people want to look at them in more detail? Um, I, I didn't see anything glaring. And, and, and again, uh, if Janet says they're okay, then... <laughs> Uh, that means a lot. That carries a lot of weight. <laughs> I'm the keeper of the minutes. <laughs> okay, so do I? Uh, is there a motion to accept the minutes? I'll move. Great. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think you have to verbally say it. All right. Just Thank you, Janet. Okay. Yep. okay. So we'll need a voice vote in no particular order. Brooks. Yeah. Jemsek? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Breger? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Okay, the minutes are approved. Great, thank you. Um, okay, and then so uh, next week we'll try to catch up with um, uh, the minutes of uh, December 16th, and then if, if possible, the minutes for today as well. Okay, um, next agenda item is staff updates. Um, so, um, Duane, staff... I'm, I'm just okay. wondering if we can actually move those two items so that Captain Bascom isn't... Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Apologize for that. Here yeah. for too much longer <laughs> than he needs to be. Until the bell rings at least, right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, great. Okay. Uh, very good point. Yep. And uh, and that way uh, we can get through this uh, th this opportunity and, and uh, to uh, talk to uh, the, the the fire chief, uh, fire captain, I should say. Um, and uh, so let me just um, thank um, uh, Captain Bascom for joining us today. Uh, it, certainly also for your service to the community, um, and uh, um, we really appreciate. You're 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 joining us. Um, as you know, we're working on solar bylaws uh, for the um, for the town uh, as, as a as a town committee. Um, and uh, part of part of our charge, in addition to solar uh, installations, is also what is often comes with solar uh, or, or or independent of solar, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, is battery energy storage as well. Uh, and it's it's emerging throughout the country and probably the world uh, with regard to these these new this new technology, fast changing um, uh, technology and advancing technology. Uh, but you know it does promise to be a really um, important part of our energy infrastructure, uh, growing in scale and size and prevalence uh, across the, the the Commonwealth and the and, and the and I suspect the town. Um, and we're. Um, as we look at the zoning issues with regard to um, storage siting specifically, the issue of, of safety, uh, fire safety um, uh, issues is, is something that we're trying to get our heads around, um, both in terms of sort of the, 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 um, uh, the, the technical issues as well, uh, technical issues involved, as well as how well prepared communities are uh, and Amherst in particular, uh, in understanding the safety issues and the um, uh, uh, and in the case of, of fire or other uh, types of incidences with these uh, batteries and the chemistries involved, um, how the fire departments are sort of understanding this situation now and and um, and prepared to take on um, this um, th these new technologies and so forth. Um, in your in your work and how um, um, and, and sort of any any thought you have for us with regard to um, the issues that we're facing in terms of zoning and so siting and zoning. Um, so th thank you, uh, Captain, uh, for joining us. Um, and um, uh, I'm not sure. I presume Stephanie or Chris have sort of prompted you a bit in terms of what we're interested in hearing from you. But um, I, I guess I'll turn it over to 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 you. Uh, unless uh, Stephanie or Chris, you want to say anything before the um, captain starts? 
No, don't have anything. I don't have anything. Thank you. Thank you to Stephanie and Chris for inviting me to be here with your working group. Um, I have a personal interest in solar as well. So um, I'm, I'm excited to sit and, and, and listen to what you have to say after this as well. Um, I did look at the presentation that came through from uh, Koppelman and Page uh, as well. And so there were a few solar uh, related zoning issues I had no no idea about until I, I, I watched that presentation. So that was that was very helpful. So thanks to uh, Chris or Stephanie, whoever sent that over, that was, that was very helpful. So I'm Chris Bascom, I'm a fire captain, and I am also the fire inspector for the town of Amherst. Uh, about 2019 is when the uh, fire service started to um, look at energy storage systems. Uh, I think initially our, 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 our issues were mostly with uh, electric vehicles, uh, scooters, and, and smaller electronics that had the lithium ion uh, batteries and the different lithium technologies uh, and chemistries in them. Uh, and that's really when it kind of came to the forefront. Massachusetts had some codes initially in 2019, but uh, the biggest changes just came last month, uh, December 9th. We accepted or we um, we got the new fire code uh, came into effect, and that is the 2021 version of the fire code. So it it really is up to date on uh, what's going on out there with the multiple installations of energy storage systems, uh, either attached to PV or uh, standalone. Um, as a fire department, we don't just deal obviously with the utility scale, like um, seems to be probably mostly what you're you're focused on, but we also deal with uh, residential as well. Um, I, I told you I had an interest in, in solar, so I have a PV system on my house. I actually also have a, a battery system uh, that I purchased in 2020. Um, so it's 17.1 kilowatts in, in my basement and in a little room there. Um, I'm kind of very interested in the, in the technology, so it's one of the reasons that I uh, I, I purchased it, and it's also one of the reasons that I'm kind of excited to be in this job as things develop around uh, energy storage systems and uh, uh, photovoltaics. So, as a fire department, our you know initial concern is always life safety, uh, and one of the nice things about the outdoor uh, systems is if um, if done properly, um, they're they're going to be um, outside of hopefully about a hundred feet from any type of exposures. Um, sorry, let me pull up my notes here again. Uh, also, um, so remote outdoor locations are considered any battery storage systems that are more than 100 feet from any building, uh, a lot line um, that can be built upon or any public way. Uh, so ideally, utility scale systems are going to be fall under that definition of remote outdoor location. So 100 feet. Anything that's uh, within 100 feet from a building, a lot line, or any public way is considered a, a location near exposures. Uh, and those are going to have size limitations. They're going to have uh, a lot more um, distance required between the actual battery um, enclosures themselves. But once they get into that definition of remote outdoor locations, they're allowed to go uh, to much larger systems. Um, ideally, the manufactured systems don't have uh, actual enclosures that people can get inside of. Um, so our biggest concern, life safety, is kind of um, a moot point at that point. And no one's going into the actual battery systems. We can keep people uh, away from them with gates. Um, so we kind of limit you know, who's actually going to be exposed to these type of things uh, on the utility scale outdoor systems. Um, so mostly it's going to be the maintenance personnel, someone who's there to fix it or to uh, investigate a problem. And then, of course, my coworkers um, um, in emergency response type of situations. Building. Obviously, we have to build these. Uh, so construction and maintenance are going to be times when people are, are going to have tendencies to get hurt. Uh, and the fire department is going to have to go out there and make some type of access uh, to the site. So um, fire department access becomes very important to us. Although it's not going to be very common or very often that we'll make it out to these systems. Um, we still need to be able to get out there first off with the ambulance, uh, being able to get there uh, with the ambulance and make sure we can uh, transport patients to the hospital in a, in a reasonable period of time uh, would be top of our list. Second reason we need access is if there is a, some type of a, a thermal runaway or a fire type of event um, so that we can get apparatus out there, a bumper truck, a fire engine, so that we can put water 
uh, either on the vegetation that are around um, the energy storage system or to actually cool the system to prevent uh, the, the thermal runaway from propagating um, from container to, to container. And like I said, with the um, remote outdoor locations, the, the containers are going to tend to be uh, closer together because uh, the separation distances aren't going to be, uh, that separation distances are going to be manufacturer dictated at that point. So whatever the manufacturer can prove um, the, the distance required so that the, the fire doesn't propagate, um, that's what, uh, that's how close they'll be able to, to place them. Same thing with size on those remote outdoor locations. Um, whatever the manufacturers have specified as uh, uh, an acceptable quantity of either energy or standalone units would be what was allowed. Um, for those. Um, when you come within the 100 feet of buildings and lot lines, uh, that's when you start looking at um, basically 10 feet becomes the, uh, um, the standard separation distance between um, the batteries and any type of egress from a building. So if they want to put a battery in an alleyway or something along those lines, uh, the battery system would need to be 10 feet from any building egress. Uh, 10 feet from the from the side of the building unless the building had the, uh, the proper hour rating uh, for the wall on the outside of the building. Um, two hours is, is generally but what's uh, commonly used. But if it's a big enough system, they may have to go to, to three hours. So um, our other concerns um, would be um, using water on these systems to cool it. Um, obviously, we have a, a concern about our, our runoff and whether our runoff is going to be uh, detrimental to the environment, to the water table, and uh, um, that sort of thing. So um, when fire occurs in these, we kind of have a situation where we need to decide, do we let these burn or do we actually put them out and cool them? And so um, we would really look to the manufacturers to provide us with an emergency operation plan on how best to operate around their equipment. We have some general parameters, SOPs, SO, uh, standard operating procedures um, or guidelines that we use when approaching uh, energy storage systems. Um, we're trying to increase some of our training here in the department so that we can get our, our newest members uh, up to speed on exactly how to deal with energy storage systems, but they're all pretty well trained on how to deal with um, live electrical um, sources. So they will treat them. Um, in that way. Um, so I discussed access, water supply, discussed uh, separation distances a little bit, life safety. Um, one of the new things that's in the um, fire code is um, they actually do now, uh, a permit is required um, from the fire department for the um, construction and operation of energy storage systems. So since that is new, that is not something at the fire department here that we've gotten um, up and rolling yet, but we're going to work with uh, our IT department to get that put into our open government system. Uh, it, a lot of it mirrors what the, what the building department's gonna look for when they uh, pull a boat building permit to uh, build, build the system. Um, it, it outlines um, what kind of plans we want. You know, we're gonna look for the full construction plans, where it's gonna go on the site, uh, what type of uh, separation there is from vegetation, separation from other, um, from the panels themselves and anything else that might be on the site. We're gonna look for them to give us a hazard uh, mitigation analysis. And it's looking like most of the manufacturers are gonna produce um, the hazard mitigation analysis for their own equipment. Um, a lot of it in the new NFPA standard, which is uh, National Fire Protection Association standard 855 uh, in that, it is um, requiring um, for them to decrease uh, separation distances. They'll need to actually do live fire events. They'll need to burn their equipment and see how it reacts um, to thermal runaways and under fire conditions. And once they know how it reacts under fire conditions, they can better uh, dictate uh, how their uh, equipment should be installed. So that's gonna be a requirement. They'll need to produce that, that document for us if they're going to um, ask for any type of variation from the NFPA standard what's the separations. Some of the manufacturers manufacture their um, enclosures so they can actually go back to back uh, and allowing them to have more energy in a smaller period of uh, a smaller place, smaller space. Um, and for them to do that sort of thing, they need to produce one of these hazard mitigation analysis with the live fire test showing that um, it is acceptable. Their, their systems will not propagate uh, the thermal runaway um, uh, because the, uh, the enclosures are, are substantial enough to, to prevent it. 
We'd want to see uh, equipment in operation and maintenance manuals for all the equipment on, on site and in the um, fire code and in the NFPA standard, it's required for those to be kept on site in some type of enclosure for us to access when we, when we arrive so that we do know exactly what type of equipment we're dealing with um, or you know, we're unfortunately, we don't always get there first. It's possible that uh, a mutual aid company could arrive and a mutual aid company from Northampton won't be as familiar with these types of systems. So having that kind of uh, documentation on site for the emergency responders and for the responders from the, from the um, um, contracting company uh, also is important. Uh, we also want a copy of their commissioning plan. And at the same time, we want a copy of their decommissioning plan. And it's actually a requirement that we have a copy of the decommissioning plan before the uh, system is, is up and running, before it's actually commissioned. Um, so uh, I'm working with um, um, zoning and uh, conservation and everybody on the uh, Port River solar project off of uh, Hickory Ridge. Um, that's one of the things that, uh, that, that we, we've discussed. So. Um, they, they already have a plan for when it's going to be decommissioned, you know, how many trees are going to be planted, that sort of thing. That's exactly what we want to see. We just want to know when, you know, when it's, this system hits at the end of its life cycle, what, what's going to happen. It's not just going to be, you know, you're obviously as concerned that it's not just going to be abandoned in place uh, sort of thing. So that's, uh, that's on our list of uh, documents to require. And then the last document is, is an actual emergency operations plan on how to uh, mitigate different types of incidences with their uh, systems, which include things from uh, brush fires that, that um, start impinging on their system from um, outside sources and or uh, thermal runaway. And uh, whether it's better to uh, put water on or to let the system burn and whether or not these systems are uh, equipped with some type of fire suppression system. So some, some of them, some manufacturers put uh, clean agent systems in uh, in order to suppress fires inside of the cabinet itself, the enclosure. We have no, we're not for or against it necessarily. Uh, it seems like we would like to see more, more hazard get mitigation analysis on, uh, on these incidences to see uh, what is the best course of action because putting you know, tens of thousands of gallons of water uh, onto one of these enclosures and then creating some type of a, a dangerous runoff is uh, not ideal. It's not what we want to do. So if it's better to let these um, enclosures burn and let it go to atmosphere, then, then that's uh, what we would do. Um, we, of course, would, like I've said before, life safety is our, our first priority. And in those situations, uh, we call in the state hazmat team. Uh, actually, about four of us on the fire department are all members of the, uh, the regional state hazmat team. And we have uh, air monitoring capabilities. So we'd bring in our air monitors and we would strategically place them uh, around, around the area in order to get ideas about what type of gases and what type of um, air quality concerns we may have. They're the same devices that the DEP has. Uh, we actually can integrate with uh, Department of Environmental Protection uh, when we do air monitoring. Um, so we would, we would work with them and we would do air monitoring while we you know, let, let something like that burn. It wouldn't just be something where we're just, again, letting it burn and not uh, taking the proper um, safety precautions and uh, for the neighbors and any other type of exposures in those situations. Uh, let's see. So in the new fire code, um, as far as spill containment goes, there is a requirement that um, spill containment should be about 10 minutes of fire flow. So that's a you know a calculation we would do based on the number of um, enclosures that are on fire uh, and how much water we would put uh, on those enclosures, and then basically we just do the math times time, ten minutes per the gallons per minute, and uh, we'd figure out how big the um, spill containment area may need to be. And uh, as far as neutralization goes, they consider, from what I've seen, most of the lithium ion technologies use an immobilized electrolyte. So in the fire code, uh, neutralization isn't uh, required for uh, immobilized electrolytes, a gel or a more solid type of electrolyte. Anything that has a full liquid uh, electrolyte is required to have some neutralization, or have required to have neutralization um, on site for those, but those would not be a lithium ion technology. Um, signage, we'd require um, signage both on the gates and on individual enclosures. 
Um, we have very specific wording uh, and um, pictograms that are used on the signage and that is dictated in, in the fire code and in the uh, National Fire Protection Association standard. Um, the other standards that we look to uh, are the underwriter laboratories, um, 9540, which is um, the standard for the, for the batteries themselves. And then UL 9540A, which is a testing standard where they, that's, that's the, the fire test. That's where they uh, set the systems on fire and see how they will uh, behave under those conditions. And then UL uh, 1973 is a little bit of an older standard, um, but it is the kind of the, the standard for standby battery systems in a, in a general sense. So they also fall under that. Great. I think those are most of my general comments on where we're at with the fire department and uh, energy storage systems as far as outdoor and um, utility scale go. We have some more very specific stuff if someone's going to put it in a one or two family home. Uh, but that I don't believe is quite your uh, interest at this point. Thanks. Great. Thank, thank you, Captain. That, that was uh, really um, a, a helpful um, rundown of, of um, sort of your knowledge base of, of, of um, storage and, and, and fire issues. Uh, really helpful and, and um, actually great to hear that um, you're, you're um, very much on top of this issue. Um, I had one question that I, I know, um, uh, I, I think, um, Jack and then Stephanie uh, in the, in that order, and then we'll if you have time and ability, we'll we'll have some Q and A. Um, uh, that would be great. Um, so I guess I my my, my first question, at least, is you mentioned as as sort of a res, the res, response to a potential fire event would be either to let it burn in place um, or water uh, suppression, and I guess um, I. I'm wondering, are those the only two options? I'm thinking particularly of the water. I, I just, you know, have heard about other foams uh, types of things because obviously it's an electrical fire. So um, uh, I, I, there's probably protocol to isolate <laughs> isolate the uh, the system from the from its electrical interconnections and so forth uh, in terms of safety for 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 water suppression. But is there um, potential use or consideration that um, might have other concerns uh, with regard to foams and so forth. I, I thought that's how um, they were fighting fires like it, in, in electric vehicles more so than water. Right, so they, they do use some foams. Um, the other agents that we use that are a little bit better than the foams, foams have, it, it takes a lot of water and a lot of time to create the foam. Um, we have to have the foam concentrate on hand and we need to mix it properly. Uh, things like dry chemicals and uh, agents, wet chemical agents, and then clean agents are all all used in different systems by different manufacturers. The clean agents are probably the more popular one. A common kind of name is FM200. Uh, it's, it's kind of a common agent that's used. And it seems that most of the manufacturers built them in initially, not really knowing, one, how the batteries were going to behave, and also not knowing where... Um, you know, fire and building code, we're gonna kind of go with the whole thing. So a lot of them initially have seemed to have built it in. Um, from what I'm hearing, um, it's 2023 and, and uh, um, supply chain issues is always uh, always the answer. Um, so from supply chain issues, I'm told you can't get a lot of the FM200, actually the brand name StatX, which was what they want to put into the, um, the Fort River uh, Hickory Ridge system. Uh, isn't even available. So they came back with us uh, telling us it wasn't available. What other options are there? Uh, if one of these systems is going to be in, 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 uh, put into an office building, in, into a, an apartment building, or that's where we would start insisting that you had some either type of a, a clean agent system, or if the building was fully sprinklered and you had a sprinkler uh, system that was able to cool uh, and fight the fire in there. Um, these systems, because they are, you know, like I said, the remote outdoor location, um, when they, uh, the, the thermal runaway initially begins in one of the cells. It will get warm enough. It will probably um, start the wiring on fire and any other types of plastics or combustibles inside of the enclosure is really what will be on fire at that point. The um, FM200, the clean agent system will fire and it will basically stop the chain reaction of the fire and remove the oxygen from the, uh, from the enclosure. 
the fire will go out. It's not cooling the thermal runaway in the battery cell though. So that will continue to occur, continue to warm up uh, and prop possibly and probably will start to perpetuate to, um, to the other cells as well. Um, so the only thing in those enclosures that burn is usually the wires, other plastics uh, and other things associated with the battery management system and, and running the batteries. So unfortunately the, the clean agent systems or the foams would uh, put out the fire, but they wouldn't provide the cooling uh, to keep the propagation of the thermal runaway from continuing. So that's why water has become the more favored um, fire suppression uh, item, just because you get the cooling along with putting out the fire. And if, if with with regard to the foams or the clean agents, are do they themselves have chemical uh, chemistries associated with them that if they got loose into the environment uh, in, in runoff uh, or up in the air, um, then they themselves would be hazardous? So the foams is exactly, that's exactly one of the reasons we don't use the foams and yeah. PFAS and a couple of the things that occur in the foams. Um, a lot of most, we, we've never used them traditionally because we don't have a lot of exposure to those sorts of fires in Amherst. Um, most of ours is just class A. Class A is anything that makes ash. So wood, paper, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so those are our, our buildings and those are our major and, and the contents of buildings. Um, so we don't have a lot of experience using those type of foams. We don't have them in town. We've never really used them. Um, the FM200 is actually was invented um, to replace halon. Uh, and halon is a uh, very uh, difficult chemical, dangerous chemical, uh, causes cancer and a couple other issues. So uh, FM200 does not cause cancer, does not have those same environmental issues. And it was actually by, uh, invented uh, for that purpose to replace the, the more dangerous chemicals that are out there. Uh, and our dry chem is uh, sodium bicarbonate, so it's a it's a right, relatively inert item. I wouldn't you know put it anywhere in large quantities, uh, but in the quantities we generally use it to suppress the fire, it's um, relatively inert, does not cause huge amounts of damage. So, water, sodium bicarb, and then the the clean agent systems. And the reason they call them clean agents is because they they do dissipate on their own into the environment and don't leave uh, they don't leave residue. Um, which is ideal for cleanup in those situations. Uh, and then they do go off into the environment and they are um, not supposed to cause cancer. I'm sure, you know, like many things, they have not been uh, out there for very long. Um, so in 20, 20 years, we'll see what the actual long-term effects are of them. But that's why they were invented because they were a safer alternative. Thank you, Captain. Yeah. Okay, so let's, um, great. Um, uh, 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 um, I think some folks eager to, to uh, ask a question or speak. So let me start with Jack and then Stephanie and then Chris and then Laura and then Janet, I think is the order that they came in. Great. You know, I'm I'm happy to have, you know, Stephanie and Chris leapfrog me given their role. <laughs> Stephanie, oh. do you want to? I'm happy to answer everyone's question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, sure. I, I don't, I, I mean, I think, Jack, you probably have a very valid question, so I'm <laughs> fine to let you go first. All righty. Um, so, yeah, so uh, you, when you mentioned you got around to the, to the water, uh, you know, concerns with the application of water to these facilities. I, I'm not sure if, did you see the white paper that the Water Supply Protection Committee uh, put together? We did have a section in there. Um, but anyway, we, we kind of um, envisioned that water would be used sparingly, if if at all. And so, like you know, from a bylaw perspective, there's a question of you know, do we need to have a fire hydrant and and you know, water coming in there? And, and we were of the thinking that you know, uh, let's not let's not do that, and let's not you know, create runoff. Uh, with regard to these storage facilities. And, and that was stemming from my understanding is that some of these battery storage, you know, with the evolution of the technology is they're, they're equipped with sensors that uh, thermal sensors that they sense the heat. And then there, so there's actually shut down before there's a chance for the thermal runaway. Um, I would, I, I was thinking that that had become much more sophisticated, but uh, perhaps that is not your, your understanding. Um, I'm not exactly sure how far the sophistication of the battery management systems have come. Um, 
but yes, you're correct. It, the battery management system, once it, it sees uh, it's running outside of its parameters, it's supposed to shut down um, that, that battery cell. And um, yeah, that's supposed to stop it. Um, but it seems like throughout the country, um, if there's manufacturing defects, something else is wrong with the, the cars are the big one. But, you know, you get in a car accident, you damage some of the cells. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of hard, even with the battery management system, shutting that cell down, if it has some sort of damage, it could still propagate heat and um, continue into runaway. I think yeah. that was the big issue. Yeah, my thinking is like, I, I think it's important that we separate the, you know, the car type batteries versus what we're looking at yeah. here. Because I think sure. the sophistication so, should be, right. you know, much higher for these, Agreed. you know, energy storage systems. But yeah. uh, so quality manufacturing, I think, and having good battery management systems will prevent the majority of the issues with these. Yeah. Um, I think when you run into low quality manufacturing where the, the cells uh, aren't as, aren't as uh, good and the quality assurance at the factories aren't as good. That's where we're running into the issues with the, with the mobility stuff, with the scooters and stuff. The, the fires in, in larger cities uh, is, is, is pretty significant. The fire has in New York. New York City is putting out quite a bit of uh, information on the scooters and things in their apartment buildings. They're having uh, a lot of issues. Um, but I think with the utility scale stuff, where it does have a higher quality manufacturer um, and um, more robust uh, uh, battery management system, you, we should be in a better place for that. Um, I'm kind of up on the air on whether we need a fire hydrant at the at, at each of the energy storage systems. Um, if as a town and we decide that you know we want to use as little water as possible on this, that's that's a fine fine decision. I, I don't I don't really I, I I can see the argument for that. Um, the fire truck's going to show up with 750 gallons um, of of water in it. It can do a pretty good job with putting out spot fires and grasses and things that are around the system as we let it um as we let it burn the other things we often do when we when things are burning is we can use our hose streams to push gases and push uh, smoke because they you know they, they entail, entail a lot of water when we push uh, uh i'm sorry a lot of air when we uh push water out of our hose streams um so we can push uh smoke and gases in, in certain directions so even if we weren't pouring water onto the actual battery uh, enclosure, we may be using water streams to uh, keep um, the smoke from going towards an apartment complex, things like that. You know, my, my, I imagine, you know, Mill Valley, right? Because the, the, the Fort, Fort River system uh, is, is kind of fresh in my mind. Um, yeah. So we would just set up a, a hose stream uh, between, between the apartments and the battery management system. And that would hopefully prevent any smoke from uh, traveling in that direction. So we may not just use the water to, to pour it onto the enclosure. Uh, and certainly if the manufacturer says, no, don't, then we, we wouldn't do that. Um, but I think that we should look at each individual system and determine whether we think a hydrant would be appropriate or not appropriate for it. Uh, Fort River is going to be tough. Like we don't have a water supply out there. There is no running water out there. If the, the river is high enough, we could actually draft right out of the river and, and use the, the river water. Um, but uh, we're not going to have a hydrant out there. We'll, we'll need to bring it in on, a, uh, on, the, on the fire truck. No, thank you. And uh, just um, so, oh, and, so with regard to the Fort River, do they, how far long is the design for their uh, BESS system? 90%, I think. 90%. I believe that was the last plan set I saw was the 90% pulse. Yeah, it'd be interesting to take a look at that, I think, for, for our, our group here. But, um, Jack, can you um, just say what BSS is, just in case people uh, in the public aren't clear? Systems. Battery energy storage system. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then so off the batteries, I was curious, since we have you, um, <laughs> with regard to, you know, all these solar fields are going to be over grass. And uh, there was a question that came up with regard to a grass fire and the amount of heat generated by, you know, uh, six inch long lawn grass uh is the heat um it, for, it seems like it would be short-lived number one and that the heat generated would be fairly mild that it wouldn't 
really be able to compromise solar panels. Uh, that was our. That would be my opinion. Okay. All right. That. that yeah. Was... Okay. Thank you. In my younger days, I did do a little wildland firefighting, and uh, one of the things they train us to use is a, an emergency shelter. Uh, and when the fire is moving quickly through uh, high grasses, you actually, it looks like a aluminum foil and you basically look like a little baked potato when you pull it over yourself and <laughs> yeah. you actually just lay in it and the, the, the fire will move through the, through the high grasses relatively quickly. And the, um, the amount of uh, heat that's put out is uh, survivable. Um, so basically you lay in that and the, and the grass fire goes right over the top of you. And then once it, once it passes, you get out of it. Um, and lots of people have survived um, in those emergency shelters over the years. So um, I would imagine it would be the same sort of thing underneath the panels where the fire would move relatively quickly uh, and it would have um, a limited amount of fuel. Yeah. yeah. The real concern is it gets towards a stand of trees or something along those lines that can really, really get some heat going. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Great. Let's return to Stephanie then. Okay. Um, Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate your taking the time and this is really informative. Um, my question has to do with you brought up um, that either uh, cooling or letting the the unit burn, you know, would be sort of the approach to how to deal with that. Is that, so I have a couple of questions based on this. Is that based on the size? Um, is it based on the manufacturing? And how do you ascertain whether you need to apply some cooling method um, is that also based on the manufacturing? So does it vary from system to system? And how would you know ahead of time if you're going to the system, what you might, what approach you might need? Yeah, um, so it is gonna vary based on, on manufacturers. If um, the more robust they make their enclosure, uh, the better it protects the stuff inside, but the better it is at keeping the water from actually cooling um, the actual battery cells. At that point, we're just basically putting a, uh, a cooling, uh, water stream on the outside of the box and that's not very effective at cooling the actual cell itself. Um, putting the water on the actual battery is what actually removes the heat from it. Um, so a lot of manufacturers will say it's pointless to put water on our enclosure because you're not going to cool it significantly enough to stop um, the propagation from one uh, battery to another within that enclosure. If their enclosure is that substantial, the idea is that fire or that heat and propagation won't leave that enclosure. So it won't go to the next one. And so when you have 25 enclosures next to each other, it's only gonna stay in that one. Um, and so that's the idea of making a more robust one, but the more robust it is, the less you can use water on it to cool. Um, so that would be the uh, big thing. Um, so we would also like a, as far as the documentation goes, we want the documentation on site. So some type of a tube or some type of a, uh, just a little doghouse sort of thing where they could have uh, the documentation for us to uh, pull out, look at if we need it. Um, there's sign, there should be an 800 number, 24 hour, um, someone's standing by 24 hours to answer that and to provide us with information and an emergency response from the company. Um, there is also, it's called ChemTrack. It's, it's another uh, kind of clearing house for chemical information, uh, but they're a 24 hour hotline that we would call and. Uh, in place of the manufacturer providing us with information, they would provide us with some uh, guidance on particular manufacturers' um, emergency response plans. And then uh, finally, we would like training. So each system that gets put in, we would like to be trained by um, the manufacturer or the installer on how their system works, where their shutdowns are, uh, whether using water on their enclosures will actually cool the batteries or whether they won't in our best uh, option in those cases is just to protect exposures and let it burn. And then my follow-up question is just um, pertaining to uh, the difference between these batteries storage systems versus things like um, electric vehicle batteries, because I know that there's maybe been some um, concern around, you know, are these likely to have an explosive nature um, right. similar to what might potentially might happen with like an EV or some other kind of um, sure. battery storage technology. But if you could talk about maybe the differences and how one is more likely than the other or whether they are equally as likely. Right. Yeah, from what I understand it is this, the cell size, um, the actual, what the cells look like uh, and the size of them um, vary from utility scale uh, to vehicles. And then I believe a lot of the manufacturers use different size 
um, cells as well. The explosive concern for us is once thermal runaway starts, uh, they're gonna start, the, the batteries themselves release toxic and flammable gases. Uh, if those toxic flammable gases are allowed to build up uh, anywhere, either whether it's in the car, whether it's in the battery cell itself, or whether it's in the full enclosure um, for the battery uh, system, uh, that's what can cause uh, an explosion. So it, it reaches what we call the, the lower explosive limit, uh, the LEL of that particular gas. And then um, we could have a, a situation where it explodes. Um, the enclosures themselves are supposed to have HVAC systems and they should have battery monitoring systems. The battery monitoring management systems should kick on the HVAC system um, anytime the temperature gets out of range or anytime um, the gas meter that's built into the uh, enclosure, which is usually a gas meter for hydrogen. It's the most common gas. It's probably the easiest one to uh, measure some of the more exotic gases. We don't necessarily have meters that can measure for them. So they kind of use hydrogen as a stand-in. And if hydrogen gets to 25% of its lower explosive limit, uh, the HVAC system should kick on and start venting um, the flammable gases outside of the enclosure themselves. Cars don't have those HVAC systems attached to their batteries. So wherever pockets of hydrogen build up, whether it's in the little cells themselves or in the actual you know, vehicle, um, that's where you could uh, lead to uh, explosion. So ventilation is super important with the lithium ion technology. So just getting those flammable explosive gases um, or keeping them from, from building up to that, that lower explosive limit. Thank you. Do, um, and before we go to Chris, just a very quick follow up on, on that, um, like these HVAC systems and so forth that are supposed to kick on, is there protocols that were, or is it the normal procedure that those are tested on a regular basis? Um, to so make those sure fall, actually, yep, so they, all of these systems should have, the manufacturers will specify, but almost anything in, as far as the fire department is concerned, we want to see annual reports on everything. Um, to see that they've been maintained on an annual basis. Someone has come in, a third party or the manufacturer themselves, and says that, yes, this is operating the way it's supposed to. It's all within normal parameters. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we would look, look for. Great. <clears throat> yeah, this has been great. Um, Christine? Hi. Um, yeah, I have a number of questions, um, so I hope that I can ask them all in a row. Um, one of the things has to do with... Um, proximity to um, trees. So you've mentioned that um, these batteries should be 100 feet from um, structures, but what if the battery is in a forest and um, should it also be 100 feet from surrounding trees? So the code says combust as far as combustibles go, um, the separation distance is supposed to be 10 feet. It also says general combustibles shouldn't be in the same. It says fire area, which generally a fire area is considered a room or a section of a building. So th that part of the code really is trying to talk about systems that are inside of buildings more than, than the outdoor locations. Um, so the only number I can really grab out of there, I think is the 10 feet, mm. but I think that's something that you know, a bylaw or zoning, or you all should definitely dictate a little bit better, specific, more specifically, because yeah, I, I would would think we need more than ten feet from a, from a large tree, and certainly we wouldn't want it overhanging the top of, you know, once it grows up, its canopy coming over the top of of a uh, over the top of the fence or even um, to the energy storage system. Yeah, because of those distances, I think ideally we'd like to see a ten foot a 10 foot, uh, basically a path around um, uh, where the uh, enclosures are themselves to the fence line. And then nothing should grow in that 10 foot radius to the fence line. And then however you treat the fence from the outside, generally you would mow once a year, whatever the, the, whatever the decision is um, around the fence line, that'll, create, that'll prevent any smaller trees from coming up in that, in that one year period. Um, but anything larger than that, I think as part of your initial site plan, you should look to keep them as far as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you know, you still want the, you know, some of the shading and the, the um, you know, keeping people from seeing it as well. Um, and uh, yeah, you don't want to take down too many trees, but I would still try to keep it in reasonable distance away. Okay, and then as we go through our, Solar bylaw, are you willing to help us to review what we're 
saying in terms of distances and different things like that. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I know that when um, the zoning board or the planning board gets um, an application for anything, a building or you know anything else that's um, that requires a land use permit, we send the applications to the fire department. And um, and you're the fellow who uh, reviews them most of the time. I think that um, yes. Mr. Olmsted, uh, Chief uh, Captain Olmsted, I think it is. Yeah, Chief Assistant Chief Olmsted. Yeah, Assistant Chief Olmsted. So he reviews them too. Um, but you would um, scrutinize applications pretty carefully to see if the fire department uh, equipment could get to a battery system and whether there would be enough clearance for your equipment to get there, whether the steepness of the slope of the driveway would be um, adequate um, and, and those different kinds of things. And then you would report to um, our department and we would pass the information on to the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board about your review. Exactly. Um, so I just wanted to confirm that. Um, but then you also have your own review because you said that you would be requiring that the fire department issue a permit for any uh, battery storage. And that would include battery storage that's either associated with an array or battery storage that's standalone, right? Correct, yeah. So you would have your own set of requirements um, that you would go through for your review. Um, and would there be an opportunity for the zoning board or the planning board to see that fire department review? Yeah, um, my fire department review would probably be very similar to the review that I provide to zoning and planning. Mm -hmm. um, it would be more specific on the chapter 52, which is the energy storage system, mm -hmm. um, maybe than the, the, the planning zoning review. Because like you said, the planning zoning review often um, focuses a lot on fire department access, making sure my access road is, you know, at the uh, ideally tw 20 feet wide minimum 10 feet in Amherst, mm -hmm. we like to go with 12, just because that's actually how wide my fire trucks are. Um, it always has to be 13 feet, six inches uh, maintained. You can't let anything grow down below that so that our apparatus can get in. And then the roads have to be um, able to handle the 40,000 um, pounds of, uh, of the fire engine with, with water on it. Mm -hmm. um, and if those you know, fire department access road requirements are met our ambulances can easily access those areas as well so mm -hmm. yeah those are definitely something that i look for in those reviews and um when we build out the open government thing i'm happy to put a notification step in there mm -hmm. uh, we'll put a notification step in there for uh, uh planning or zoning and it will notify you that there is a fire department uh permit for an energy storage system mm -hmm. okay and then I, I think it'll probably end up, we'll, we'll merge residential and commercial in that case. So you'll just have to, we'll, we'll maybe we can put in something that, so you don't necessarily get notified on, on all the residential ones because there, there's a lot. <laughs> I'm not sure that you necessarily want to or need to see. I think we did a 22 of them mm -hmm. last year, yeah. something along those lines. So um, there's a whole bunch of small batteries going into people's homes all over town. But yeah, no, we can absolutely do that. Okay. Um, another question is, um, <clears throat> if you didn't use, need to use water, um, we've thought a lot about um, detention of stormwater in these uh, facilities, um, and that's calculated, you know, there's a certain way of calculating that, but how would we calculate the need to um, store runoff from the fire department using uh, water to put out a fire and, you know, to 200 what is it 750 gallons is that what you said that's yeah, not very much right that's no. not a lot and it's you probably need four minutes. to have that and then you'd have another truck and then you maybe have another truck and yeah. so how would we be um figuring out how much storage there might be needed to store that kind of runoff which may be contaminated right yeah so the the actual number is really hard to come up with the fire code came up with the 10 minutes of, uh, of fire stream. Um, so we, we could get you the number based on the, um, basically the, the nozzle and the hose that we'll be using to create that stream. So I can get you gallons per minute uh, on what we'll be putting on onto that. And, and a thousand gallons a minute isn't, isn't an un, uh, unreasonable 
gallon flow uh, for trying to cool something off like that. So yeah, 10,000 gallons uh, over it would, would be what it is over, over 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, that is a, a rough estimate, but I would like to, um, we actually have a meeting um, with the Department of Fire Services next week where hopefully we'll discuss this a little bit more. Um, so I'd like to see what other fire departments are doing um, around the state with um, trying to figure out the, the runoff situation. Um, as you mentioned, we've, we've discussed this in meetings before uh, with, with Aaron from, from Conservation. Um, and yeah, we're still kind of got to nail down a, a good number. Um, and unlike- so I don't uh, have the best answer for that one. So I just wanted to say one more thing. Unlike storage of stormwater, um, you actually want the stormwater to infiltrate into the ground, but this type of runoff may be contaminated, and so you wouldn't want it in, to infiltrate, so you'd actually want some kind of a lined container um, yes. to carry that. Yeah, we'd want a, that. a contractor to be come in and be able to come in and pump it off. Yep, put it into, uh, usually into drums and take it away, which is expensive and, and difficult. Um, but yeah, yeah, we would want it contained so that it could be pumped off. Okay, it as sounds a hazardous, like we, hazardous waste. Thank you very much. Sounds yeah. like we have um, some things to talk to you about, and um, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris, for those questions and Chris for those answers. Um, Laura, if you're able to um, speak with us. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, I have good connection. So let me know if you stop being able to hear me. Um, so thanks so much. Uh, that was really valuable. Uh, uh, to hear how you guys are looking at this. And I definitely appreciated the uh, desire to be trained and look at manufacturer instructions. One thing I wanted, um, but I don't know if it's public yet, but I know that obviously, you know, my expertise is certainly, or my, you know, industry knowledge is around the battery storage units that are uh, commercial in nature, not attached to a building and typically go alongside um, solar. And I know that some of the larger companies like the Nexteras and the AESs of the world, Fluence, um, have done some, some test burns in conjunction with some of the larger um, installations in California and Arizona, like the really large 200 megawatt battery storage projects that come in like boxes and multi, you know, many of them. Um, and one of the things that this was done about a month and a half ago that they found was that um, the fires, in fact, the instruction was not to even touch the battery itself, because I think it, the point was raised before that the containment unit itself, in fact, opening it up or putting water on it or even putting foam on it um, was ill-advised in that the main point of the test was to see if the fire um, went to, there was that thermal runoff, runaway, and went to other units, and they found that it didn't. Um, so I think, I think just like anything else, and I certainly heard this in your, in your presentation, um, this technology certainly continues to evolve. Um, but what I'm hearing, you know, largely in the industry is that um, certainly no water uh, for the types of units I'm discussing that, that are on my mind. Um, and I'm going to see if there's any of those, you know, I, I would, I would hope that they start to publish these white papers of these controlled burns, um, you know, that we could use those as guidance as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did have a question about the berm. So they're, they're creating berm around the entire uh, energy storage system so that that, that would hold the water. Yeah. So, right. yeah. So, what, 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 yes, no, no. So, so they're saying no water at all. What they did is they actually created a fire inside of one of the battery units to yeah. see what it would, because you know, there was a, there was a terrible incident in Arizona where there was a fire with the battery units and the firefighters yeah. opened the door yeah. um, and actually in opening the door and introducing oxygen, there was a massive explosion and firefighters wow. got injured. Um, so in response to that, they actually did a controlled burn situation and to test like, you know, will, will, will other battery units catch on fire? Will the fire leave that contained storage area? And what they found that is that it didn't as long as you basically don't touch it, like you don't add water, you don't open up the doors, which is counterintuitive, I would imagine, for any you know typical firefighting situation. So 
I think exactly that's think not just, firefighters just, first. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, and I think yeah. just like just like anything else, I think it's a matter of not only training, but like you know what is what specific technology are we putting in, and what are the specific recommendations to the manufacturers so that no one gets injured, um, and that there's not this environmental situation in addition to you know potential health issues. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, after that uh, Arizona incident. Um, Underwriter Laboratory put out a, a really good training program, and that was really one of the big things is that if we don't need to go touch the container, uh, open doors, open uh, shutters, then we shouldn't. If we start introducing oxygen into those containers, uh, if there is uh, enough hydrogen, it may, may be too rich to burn. Uh, and as soon as we open one of those containers, it drops down into its explosive uh, range, and that's where uh, you get what happened in Arizona and the the fire captain there got blown back right. through through the fence and right. yeah across the desert. Uh, he yeah, he lived to it, tell the tale. Uh, he does do yeah, some pretty good training programs explaining. Yeah, if you especially yeah. if you're connected with that group, I mean they are the ones that have the information on the controlled burn that was done. Um, and, and I think I think those are you know that's certainly leading technology right now. Um, yeah. So um, that's great. So, I'm glad to it's right. refreshing. I know you guys are talking to them. So we are definitely going the direction of no water. Um, we've had energy storage systems here in Amherst long enough though. Uh, I wanna say 2018 or 2019 is when UMass put in their system down by um, the central heating plant. Uh, and it was early enough, uh, it was long, it was before the Arizona incident um, that uh, they, we actually built in a, um, a, a standpipe system. It actually has a, a, a external pipe um, about 30 feet outside the fence. Actually, it's attached to the fence, but it's about 30 feet from the fence line to the energy storage systems. And we can actually attach to it and pump directly into the enclosures themselves. Uh, that was the manufacturer's recommendation at, in those years. Um, and it's pretty clear that we've gone far away from that. Uh, we have a second system on campus that's on, off of North University Drive near the parking lots. Uh, and that's a Tesla system. And that one actually is manufactured without any fire suppression at all. And their recommendation is just as we we just discussed, you, you let it burn. You don't uh, you don't engage with their equipment. If you if it, they can remotely shut it down, they'll, they'll remotely shut it down. And then we just isolate the isolate the Tesla Tesla boxes and let them do their thing. And as you know, they've they've done enough testing that they do believe that it won't, or they believe that it won't uh, propagate from uh, container to container. Yeah. Yeah, and like I was saying before, the more robust those containers are to keep it from propagating from container to container, the more likely water won't really cool or do anything um, other than make a big mess. So yeah, it does seem water is becoming less uh, uh, less of the uh, agent of uh, favor. But water, as far as uh, grass fires and other uh, fires in the vicinity that could be set off as a result of the, you know, the thermal um, insult from the, from the battery itself, then we would still use water in, in those those situations. So. Great, thank you, thank Laura, you. Um, for that, and 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 Chris for that response. And it sounds like Laura, I guess it, you know if you can keep track of any of that work that you're very um, familiar with, um, <clears throat> and bring that to us, that would be great as well. Um, all right, uh, Janet, you are next. Thank you, thank you, Chris. This is super informative. I wondered if we could go back to sort of um, fire batteries and fires 101. Could you just describe the difference between thermal runaway and a fire in a battery, like really graphically for a lay person? I guess, not very well, but I'll try. Um, <laughs> thermal run runaway is going to be, as I understand it, it would kind of an imperfection in the battery itself that causes some sort of short to occur. Um, and the battery continues to take on electricity or take on power. Uh, and it kind of does a, yeah, gets into a feedback loop between heat uh, and energy. And it just continues to get warmer and warmer. Um, a fire I mean, in this I situation, I would- yeah, I know what a I, fire I, does. It look like a fire? I think like a, is it a chemical like a wire reaction? Could still, yeah. Right, it, it is a chemical reaction, but a little bit different, right? So the other kind of fire we're thinking of at the enclosure would just be from a, pla a 
the plastic heating up or uh, the, the, the outside of the wire, the coating of a wire, maybe that wire itself gets a short and has nothing to do with the battery at all. Uh, and then the uh, insulation on the outside of the wire uh, could catch on fire. Uh, and that would be a fire in the enclosure that had absolutely nothing to do with the actual battery um, chemistry or technology. I think those are the two big differences between a fire that involves uh, a battery system and thermal runaway. So if something was on fire inside that battery system, it would, you know, it could just, whatever is burnable burns and it goes out, right? Or there's not enough yeah. oxygen, so it can't burn. In thermal runaway, I just had this idea that it just can go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, yes. It doesn't need oxygen. They've, they've oh, put okay. lithium batteries into under underwater and they'll continue to um, run away. Yes. And so it just keeps so burning. To be cool to so it burns at a really high temperature until it sort of exhausts itself somehow, or you, and you're trying to cool it down to cool down the reaction. Okay. Right. And keep it from spreading to the other cells that are next to it. Um, okay. Yeah. Cause they found, I know we're not necessarily talking about vehicles, but um, when, uh, once they actually cool the vehicle enough, they've, they've put them into, you know, the, the tow company has come and put them in their yards and 24 hours, to two days later, um, the battery that was, you know, had the insult managed to warm itself up enough that it re, re goes back into runaway again. Um, the fire departments had to come back to the, back to the site and cool the, cool the vehicle one more time. Um, it seems like that is uh, common with vehicles. Um, haven't heard much about that sort of thing with the, with the um, utility scale. So this always makes me happy now that I don't have a garage. And so <laughs> can I just ask a follow up for that, Janet, real sure, quick? Sure, go ahead. Get it in my own mind as well. So if thinking about it more in a container, if there is this thermal runaway in, in, a, in a cell or a few cells, and it's, it's, it's in this feedback loop of heating up and heating up, I mean, what What's the worst case scenario there? Is it that everything in, in the box basically melts down into a chemical mess, but it's all well contained and, and just stays there, um, uh, especially to the extent that you can't really cool it down because it's all contained and you don't want to open up? So is the worst case scenario sort of that it just like all melts down and it's maybe a, a pretty chemical mess, but it, it's all contained? That's what we would want it to be. Yeah. yeah. Um, most of those containers, the base portion of it is actually supposed to, you know, contain the um, contents of it if it was to start melting down. Um, so yeah, ideally that's what it is. I mean, most of those are, are pallet sized and, you know, you can come in with a forklift and pick it up. And the idea is one of those melts down, all the contents basically consume itself, big mass of plastic at the bottom. They come in with the forklifts, they pick it up, they take it away and they put another one in its place. They plug and play type of situation and off they go and it's still still able to function because it didn't and you know the, the enclosure was substantial enough that it didn't affect any of the other enclosures around it so i and, think that then, is that's their idea and so if there's cracking in that enclosure that could induce air and that's the potential for explosion then right or okay or right we, yeah. hopefully the containers are made so that there are some relief areas um, so that if it wouldn't necessarily, it would, the, the top would come off and allow the, the, the products to vent as opposed to the entire container failing in some catastrophic fashion. Explosion is the you know, common, common term for that, but um, it may not happen quickly. It may happen slowly as well. So, Okay, that helps me a lot. And so um, my next question is, has, have, have the firefighters trained like I know you train on regular fires all the time. Have they trained like watch in like in a thermal runaway situation or a battery? Like, is that part of your training? So it's slowly becoming part of our training. Um, some of us like myself and the fire chief and a couple of the other captains are on the state hazmat team. Um, so I actually have my certificate right next to me that says that I just, just did my, my eight hour training on uh, energy storage systems. Um, so we actually do a, quite a bit of training on all types of chemical hazards. Um, that exist for us as firefighters. Um, but we're slowly getting to the point where um, we'll get a, get get everyone here trained up and uh, understanding it. All our, our line officers understand how to operate um, in and around these areas. All I believe everyone has seen the Arizona incident. So we all know better than to enter the, enter the gate and to start uh, opening containers and flipping switches and things like that. So um, they will stay, stay, stay 
far away, call the 800 number on the outside of the gate and get some type of uh, other um, uh, responders coming from the uh, manufacturer or contractor at that point. Um, but that's one of the things that as these systems get built up and we have that requirement in it, every time we get a new system, we'll get more training from that manufacturer. Uh, mm -hmm. Depending on how we want to do it, I think continuing training, um, you know, on an annual semi, you know, every two years or whatever, if they come back out and tell us what's new with their, with their system, or if nothing is new, just reiterate the training that we got initially. Um, we have a lot of, we have plenty of, plenty of new people coming and going. So uh, always providing some, some training for our younger folks is, is, is great. So updated so, training is also something we'd like. So, um, so you were also like talking about like control systems, like, you know, you know, information from how the batteries are heating and, you know, ostensibly that would go back to the manufacturer in real time, the way um, my, I, you know, like the way information from an electric, you know, a battery bus goes back to the manufacturer. My Toyota is always talking to me and, and Toyota somehow mystically. And so, um, and so, so those systems rely on electricity, right? To, so, um, so which, you know, I, I kind of think of something, you know, the electricity goes out. So is a backup generator needed on site for, to keep those systems, making sure the battery's being cooled, not getting too hot, all the chatter that goes on between the computers and stuff like that. So is that one of the requirements? I don't, I, don't, I have not seen anything about a requirement for that. And I would think if you had other battery systems that were intact or you had PV, you know, panels uh, connected to it, you would have plenty of sources for, um, for power. Um, yeah. if I look at my inverter for my system, one of the, one of the reasons I don't, you know, have as much power coming out of it is because the inverter itself takes, takes some of that, um, that power to power itself initially before, you know, putting it to the battery or sending it back to the grid or giving it to the house to use. So then so, the system, the battery system itself is regulating itself, hopefully. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's the battery battery management system. It's supposed to be regulating. Mm -hmm. It provides its own electricity and it manages temperature um, gases. So there'll be a smoke detector in there. There'll be a hydrogen detector inside of the container. Um, and it'll be reporting back to a fire alarm panel somewhere within the, the gate there um, that will notify us if there's a fire, but also notify the manufacturer if the temperature starts getting outside of parameters uh, or the gas detector goes off or something along those lines. Yeah, but some type of uh, infrastructure failure where you lose the IT um, or the IP, you know, you, you lose the internet to that site. Um, then, or, or they're using cellular depending on where it's located, but either way, if they lose that ability to monitor the site, then that's one of the things we'd like to see them come out within, you know, 12 to 24 hours to kind of fix that situation. Um, hopefully they would put that into their emergency plan and let us know if they had a failure of communications with their devices, what are they, what, what's their action going to be? How long do they come out and, and remedy that situation? Cause that's where obviously it could get dangerous if they had some type of communication failure and then an actual thermal runaway and no one no one knew about it no one knows couldn't about uh, it. keep others safe yeah. um okay and then I have a very simple question how many 750 gallon trucks do you have <laughs> like how, so long, we have, how long can you keep that going if you need it right um so one of the problems is the bridges there are only can only hold so much weight so we have all of our friends um in the surrounding towns who don't have as many high fire hydrants as we have they have tanker trucks so they have trucks with, you know, 3,000 gallons in them. Okay. Um, so we call them, they come and uh, provide us with plenty of water for um, locations where we may not have hydrants. Um, but our, our engines all, most of them have, three or four of them have 750. We have one with a, um, a thousand gallons in it. So okay. it's Thank varying, you. varying amounts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're back to Jack. <laughs> I just wanted to circle back a uh, simple question, but I, I think with regard to what Janet was saying, I think that the, 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 it's probably still going to require a 120, but some of the sensors and things like that, they're, they're very low voltage sort of thing and probably can just, you know, keep on going and, and doing their job. But um, just going back to the white paper that the Water Supply Protection Committee uh, prepared, uh, we borrowed uh, segments from a mass DP paper with regard to energy systems near uh, public water supplies, like within the zone one, within 400 feet of the public supply well. And they just, they mentioned a high pressure fire extinguishers containing Novec 1230 or equivalent. 
uh, must be located on site. What is that the dry chemical? Yeah, no, that's a, a clean agent system. Yeah, that's similar to the FM 200 that I, I spoke of before. What is that again? It's a, called a clean agent system. So it comes out in a, it's comes out in either an aerosol or a gas form. And the idea is that the product of the chemical is light enough uh, that it doesn't actually come out of the air and doesn't leave a residue. Uh, it actually will just dissipate into the uh, atmosphere after it hangs in the enclosure for a certain period of time. Different products um, will stay suspended in air for, some of them will stay suspended in air for an hour and they'll actually stay inside of the container and continue to stop any type of uh, fire from, from starting. What, what's the chemistry of that? Um, mm, not exactly sure on that one. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> then I just want to read. Uh, okay, so if the, and this is in our, in our paper, I just want to make sure this is fairly accurate and reasonable to you. Uh, but we Could I ask real quick? Um, so this is the water supply uh, protection white paper. Correct. Right. Yeah. I just want to look that up and read it myself. So. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's on page uh, nine. But uh, so we said if the suppression system isn't successful, the procedure uh, would be allow it would be to allow the container to burn. They would suppress vapors, contain runoff, and take steps to ensure the fire doesn't spread to other containers. And clearly, PFAS cannot be utilized with any firefighting chemical agents. And then we mentioned the new fire suppression technologies being implemented, uh, and we mentioned Stat X. But you're saying that that isn't available. That's what we were told. Yeah, the manufacturer said that, uh, yeah, Amp, Amp Energy came and told us the manufacturer said that it was not available until 2024. Yeah. And then I, and I then, still get advertisements in my email every week from them trying to sell it to me, though. So, uh -huh. yeah. And then, and then it, just like you said, you, we want to make sure all the fire suppression uh, chemicals, uh, you know, don't have, you know, a significant toxicity to them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to have MSDS sheets, so the uh, safety data sheets on all the chemicals that are on site in any industrial situation. So we would like that for this too. Um, so we would we would want to have the SDS sheets related to both the electrolyte solution and any fire suppression uh, agents that they were using. So that would give us uh, health hazards, environmental hazards, um, mitigation of spills and fires. Thank you. Great, great presentation. And, and yeah, we, I have, I have one more question. Um, uh, as long as uh, Captain, you have a little bit more time. Sure. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, and, and then it looks like Janet may may as well, and then we'll try to wrap things up. But um, so um, mainly, what we've been talking about, and for good reason, is sort of the state of the art batteries now, and as we see in the next uh, coming coming into the market in the next uh, years, a uh, few years. Uh, my sense is that um, uh, is that the chemistries are constantly changing. New chemistries are coming forward in terms of battery technology, and there's also um, especially as there's maybe more and more interest in longer term storage, uh, longer duration storage, um, this concept of these flow batteries, um, mm -hmm. uh, which are um, others may know better than myself. I'm not a chemist at all, but uh, in my understanding is there's really two fairly substantial volumes of, of liquid agents that are sort of trading the energy back and forth with each other, uh, which um, is a very different situation. Um, than than uh, lithium ion batteries uh, in terms of just the way they're uh, structured and and, uh, and and the chemical issues. I'm wondering um, whether any of the fire trainings and certifications um, are addressing uh, these different technologies as well, or what your expectations are in terms of how the fire departments um, will become familiar and prepared with with a uh, maybe a, a never-ending uh, portfolio of, of battery technologies and uh, yeah. coming forward. Yeah, um, I think as far as the, the line firefighters go, there's not a lot coming out about the alternative technologies. Um, we've discussed them with on the hazmat team as we've had some subject matter experts come in. Uh, NFPA 855 actually has chapters on uh, capacitor energy storage systems, fuel cell energy storage systems, superconducting uh, magnetic energy storing systems, and flywheel storage systems, um, all of which are, you know, um, emerging technologies, or most of which are emerging technologies. Uh, I've, I'm not sure which one of the electrochemical, I think, is where flow falls. Mm -hmm. It does um, mention flow batteries in there. It does not have, a, doesn't address a lot 
uh, of the safety features, um, but they leave it uh, pretty wide open so that well, every two years when they change the standard, they're able to add uh, new chapters and new information. So my guess would be on the 2022 edition, when it comes out later this year, they may have more on that, but definitely by the 2024 edition, um, they'll continue to add more uh, information and uh, requirements for standards uh, as they become more popular. I've heard of them, but I'm not very familiar with the flow battery yet. Yeah, great, thank you. All right, Janet, and then we'll 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 go with Martha, and then um, hopefully try to wrap up. So I, I this is I'm a little I remember reading in some minutes or maybe the last set about um, the possibility that the state would preempt um, battery storage with its own regulations. Is that what you're talking about when you talk about this book of 2022 or? Are we still waiting for the state to come in with like agency regulations? I'm, I'm a little, I don't know if you can answer this, but I'm a little confused about like the layers of state government or manuals and manufacturer recommendations. Like what, like, could the state just say, this is how we want battery storage to go everywhere? Or have they said that? Or will they say that? Or so the fire code, like it came out in December. Um, well, the original one was 19 and they addressed some of the, the issues with battery storage, but the, the big one came out in, in December and that's where they accepted the National Fire Protection Association um, standard 855. Okay. And that's the kind of the big standard that uh, nationally addresses all of, all of the issues. Prior to that, Massachusetts in 2019 had added some, some material, but they didn't, the 855 wasn't fully prepared yet. So they weren't able to accept that National Fire Protection Association standard as uh, Massachusetts code. But as of December, they were able to accept it as code. So I think that's what people mean by saying that the state is gonna have codes on this. Um, we're still waiting on the 10th edition of the building code. At some point that's supposed to also come our way. Um, and I'm almost positive that that will have uh, mirroring and or more stringent requirements um, than um, the fire code. So you, I'm sorry, you said um, state yeah. building code? Yeah, the state building okay. code. Okay. Yeah, 780 CMR would be the state building code. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the, the 527 CMR one is the comprehensive fire code for the state. Okay. And chapter and you, 52 oh. is, the, is the specific chapter about energy storage systems in the fire code. And a lot of that though references directly back to NFPA 855 because that document is uh, much more uh, robust. So, and then usually towns can be more strict but they can't be less strict. So the preemption would be this, the, the state saying, this is it, you can't get more strict but no one said that so far. No, I thought when I did that compliment in page training I thought that was the, the watch the presentation and did the watch the PowerPoint there. I thought that was interesting that it's almost like the state doesn't uh, want towns to be more more stringent on the on the PV installations and they really want them to be um, more popular, more you know more of them. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. But no, I don't believe the state has any uh, has any issue at this point. I could start it, run everything by the fire state fire marshal's office and get their opinion, get the, their their attorneys' opinions from the Department of Fire Services on whether uh, local bylaw can. Be more stringent but it seems like they usually are so it would make more sense for us to make more more stringent and or very specific um recommendations or, or rules in our bylaw yeah okay all right thank you thank you awesome martha yes just just to summarize thank you very much for this very informative uh, session and and so what i'm hearing it sounds like that in our solar bylaw we may want to put a few of these sort of general requirements that, that you've brought up, and then perhaps refer either to an appendix or refer to a document that the fire department would provide that wouldn't specifically be part of the bylaw in the sense then that auxiliary document then could be continually updated as new technology comes around and so on. Uh, and the bylaw wouldn't have to be changed, but the bylaw would have enough information that developers would would know where to turn and and have enough information that they know what they're having to propose. Is that yeah. is that a decent summary of of, of what we've heard? It is or? yes. 
That's one of the reasons that um, the state fire code often refers back to uh, National Fire Protection Association standards uh, is because those standards tend to be more specific. Um, they have uh, a lot of subject matter experts that stand that sit on the boards for those uh, and they're able to adjust those quicker. Uh, and so Massachusetts will just say, reference you know, uh, NFPA 855 and instead of going through all of what Massachusetts wants so that um, as the technology changes and as the 855 committee changes their code, Massachusetts kind of stays up with that. So yeah, in a similar way, we would make references in the bylaw to other codes and standards, um, which would be continually updated um, so that we stay up to date with, uh, with our requirements. Yeah. yeah. So okay. it sounds like Chris and Chris really would need to get together and decide which uh, requirements need to be in the zoning bylaw as opposed to. Yeah, and I think things like, you know, your separation distances, your required documentation, some of those things are, you know, just making sure they're in there so that when someone says, what do you want? We say, this is exactly what we want. And there's no real question that if they didn't provide us with something and there's an issue, we already, you know, we have some place to turn and be like, this is, this is what we needed and this is why we need it. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie. Just very quick. I just wanted to let Chris know that um, I sent you the uh, white paper so that you have it in your inbox. On the water. For supply. ease of access on the water supply protection Perfect. committee. So thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Appreciate that. All right, I see no more uh, hands up, uh, so this is great. And let me um, thank uh, Captain um, for your time today and your expertise um, and your willingness to continue to work on th these issues with 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 us and with with Chris uh, in planning, particularly um, for your um, interest and support of solar generally, uh, personally, um, uh, um, and. Um, uh, just thank you for, for 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 you know talking to our group and taking taking the time today. It's been really really insightful. These are these have been this issue of battery storage has been sort of um, an area that we've been always talking about for the for the duration so far that we really wanted to to um, get more insights in. And it's uh, actually pretty um, quite reassuring, at least from my perspective, to um, know that we have a captain that's uh, well on top of these issues um, and familiar with these issues. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed uh, discussing this with you and talking about it. Not a lot of people you can talk talk about this issue with. <laughs> people get kind of bored. <laughs> exactly. Okay, great. Yeah, have um, me back anytime. Just, appreciate just that. how to get in touch. Okay, Thank great. You. And thanks to Stephanie and Chris uh, for setting for setting it up with you. Great. Okay, and you're welcome to stick around, but um, we'll carry on. I'm actually going to sign off. I have another inspection to do, but thank you. It was nice meeting you all and be well. Okay, very good. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye, Chris. Okay. All right. Any thoughts on that before we go to the next agenda item or circle back? Um, do we want to take do we want to take public comment on I think people are probably most interested in this I and mean, we could wait till later but i wonder I, I was thinking about that i didn't necessarily want to keep the captain around uh to, to, uh, i didn't know if it was appropriate for him to um address public comments at this point um but um uh i'm not opposed to that but at the same time i'm wondering we have we have you know only about 20 minutes left uh we probably want to reserve some of that for sure for public comment i'm pleased to see that we have quite a few public attendees today. Um, I'm wondering whether there's anything on our agenda that we want to um, get through today. Um, obviously, I think the presentation on the um, draft bylaw sections that Chris had provided to us in the packet, um, my sense is we'll wait on that for the next um, meeting, because uh, that's going to be more than a 10 minute conversation. Uh, but um, to the extent that people have the opportunity to review that uh, before the next meeting would be great. There is some uh, at, at, at um, uh, on the, um, uh, I forget which document it is, but the one that sort of provides our mission and so forth um, and purpose. Um, there is some items at the bottom that um, suggest that um, Janet, I think you were going to 
um, add some um, draft some some um, some language to, to add to that um, document as well. I was um, excited to see that. I was just wondering. My idea was to wait till the end so we figure out what we're regulating. Um, do you know what I mean? So if we if we have an overlay district explaining that, or um, I mean, I could draft up language for anything really. So I just wondered, like clearly, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's what we do as lawyers. But um, so, um, but I just I always thought that you know we could we need it's it's clear from listening to the um, Jonathan the attorney that we need to have a justification and some reference. And I was thinking of like a long whereas clause or stuff like that, but I, I kind of don't want to do it until I know what our recommendations are for like where it goes, you know, you know, why we chose certain areas and things like that. Does that make sense to you, Chris? May I respond? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think please. that's totally, uh, that totally makes sense. You need to come up with language to back up what we say in the bylaw and we haven't said anything in the bylaw yet. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Good point. Um, okay. Great. Um, Okay, so um, was there anything else we wanted to touch on quickly um, before we maybe end, open up to public comments? Um, anybody, uh, anything else on the agenda we want to cover? Duane, we had staff updates and committee updates, but if you want to do public comment first and okay. put those at the end. Yeah, let's do that to see um, uh, how much engagement um, the public wants um, to have uh, at this point. So, um, and I, I really appreciate that we have, um, I think, eight, 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 eight uh, people. nine, uh, sorry, it's hard to tell, um, eight, I guess. And I think there were even more uh, a bit, bit ago. So yeah, let's please, let's move to that. So if anyone um, would like to comment on the presentation or has any questions that we could follow up with Chris Bascom on, um, please electronically raise your hand and I will allow you to speak. Okay, Mike Lipinski, you can unmute yourself. Uh, hi. Hi. As I've been listening today, I've heard many references to uh, AMP's Hickory Ridge Solar Project. And I know obviously the Solar Bylaw Study Group was not in charge of that project. Although you seem to be talking about many issues that are related to such an endeavor. Um, my understanding is that the construction of this project was supposed to start last spring and then was postponed to starting this month, but there's no sign of any activity there and I thought I heard a reference to their battery storage plans during the meeting today as still being incomplete. And I was wondering if there's anyone, uh, especially the staff members or a committee member who has any information about what's going on with this project. Chris, do you want to address that? Well, it did receive its um, Zoning Board of Appeals special permit. Um, and so it's clear with the Zoning Board of Appeals. I think it's just about ready to um, begin construction. I haven't heard of any holdups at this time. Um, so I, I don't really have, you know, state of the art or state of the minute um, information on that, but I haven't heard anyone speaking about it, you know, in uh, with c great concern. Related to that, are there any existing plans. I know I've looked through the ZBA plans when they were going for their special permit, but I haven't ever seen any detailed plans about how many batteries are they going to have, where are the battery is going to be located, um, anything in detail. And it just seems like before they got a building permit, those kind of plans would have to be created. And is there a source where someone can actually find that information? Um, if you email me uh, and ask that question, I can um, find out if I can get a link or a set of drawings for you. Um, so you can email me at, at the planning department email. Okay. Because and Mike, I'm sorry, to... copy me as well, because uh, we may have them in conservation if planning doesn't have them. Right. And you know, I don't want to be off topic here, but just one of the reasons why I bring it up is I know one of the major issues there is access across the river and the shaky nature of the bridge. And I know that in the plans, they're supposed to do something about that bridge. 
And of course, that's very related to what the fire uh, captain was speaking about today, where he's talking about the huge weight of emergency vehicles and fire trucks filled with 750 gallons of water. I can imagine they'd be a little tentative about crossing Fort River on a shaky bridge with something like that. So I was just wondering if there was any delay that was related to say fire protection. And I thought Jack mentioned something about the battery plans being only 90% complete or something like that. And it just seems to me like you don't start a project until your battery plans are 100% complete. So that, that's why I have questions and certainly there's zero sign of any activity down there. So just curious and, there's, and uh, I appreciate any information you can give to the public. Um, I could maybe, uh, so my understanding is that um, the battery storage component came in after the initial uh, array was proposed. And so I think maybe, and this is speculative on my part, but I used to be the wetlands administrator. So um, my guess is that because they came in later that they're still under review. And so um, it may be that it, there's no construction because they're still uh, reviewing the, that additional component. So, right. but and I could find out more and you could reach out to Aaron Jacques, who's the wetlands administrator who works for the conservation commission. And if you want, you can just reach out to me and I'll get the information to Aaron. Right, like the issue that Chris brought up about containing uh, you know, runoff from a, from a fire or something. And, you know, is there a plan to do that with this particular project? I know you guys are dealing with future projects but here's a project that supposedly has been approved. And I'm wondering, you know, what is their, uh, what is their method of dealing with many of the issues that you brought up here? They are, I know that they are looking at that as part of the Hickory Ridge project for the battery storage. Again, because there are significant wetland resources on site. So that is being looked at carefully. And I think, again, that's likely the holdup and why you're not seeing construction is because they are specifically addressing this very issue. Okay. That's that's what I was wondering. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Any any um, other people from the um, uh, public attendees want to offer any questions or comments? I don't see any, Stephanie. Uh, I don't see any yet. Sometimes it takes people a little bit, but. <laughs> Um, no, I don't see okay. anyone from the public with additional questions. Great. Okay. Um, I think before we end, end uh, um, run out of time, um, I do want to make sure we have our next meeting on the books. And I'm trying to recall how we left things, um, which I don't, at least on my calendar, I don't see any um further meetings it's um, january 20th Dwayne. we okay. did actually say that for that one and i think right. you wanted to invite um aaron jock to that meeting uh, yes the wetlands administrator yeah. but also um i was going to give my update but i can quickly say that i think adrian because this is specific to agenda yeah. setting um adrian dunk from gza is planning on um presenting the revised survey after everyone's input um, to the committee and also will be um, addressing the, the initial protocol for community outreach and engagement at that meeting as well. And you all will get that information prior to the meeting that you can review so that you can bring questions to her on the 20th. So I don't know if you wanna maybe put Erin off another meeting. I mean, this might be, I don't know how much time. I mean, you also have Chris uh on the agenda as well so maybe yeah, do, make, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. make and, and uh, thank you for that stephanie i did know that they were on uh, gza was on tap i didn't know that was scheduled with the date already but that's great so that'll be the 20th um at are we sticking with the 11 30. that was my understanding yep. okay i think we all. did decide that that was uh, at the end of the day it seemed to work for folks so um uh that would be great um and what do people think about um having Aaron Jacques, the wetlands administrator at that meeting as well, or should we, um, I do want to, I, I do feel like I want to catch back up with the 
with the drafting that Chris Chris has done from planning uh, to obviously that's at the at the end of the day that's what we need to do. Um, so I want to make sure we have sufficient time uh, to get caught up on 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 uh, what planning has come up with so far. So my my inclination would be to spread out the the, the love with our guest speakers and and put Eric uh, Eric sorry Erica Aaron. Eric, Aaron, Aaron, um, I'll for another if she's available for the next for the two weeks later. That would be February third. Twenty twenty. Be the meeting 20, after 20, that. Twenty twenty three is marching on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, okay, um, Martha, Please. Janet, do you have comments on this? Yeah, I kind of. Um... Well, let me go with Martha first. Sorry, Martha. Okay. Okay. Two things. Yeah, I'd, I, I, I would vote for the doing the survey questions next time because it's my understanding that that Stephanie wants to get started on actually conducting the survey with yeah. the right in February. So I think we need want to hear about uh, you know both the survey questions and how the survey will be carried out, which I think is interesting that I learned about. And then I would say that that also important is to is to then get going on what uh, Chris Brestrup has about the the um, actual writing of the document. And then just one quick question along that line, following up from Michael Lipinski, you know, the fact that that all these questions come up makes me want to ask, and this would be relevant for our bylaw. Uh, is there going to be a some stipulation as to who? in our town then follows up with with a um a developer on a project that's undergoing who would is there a stipulation as to who is the point person that everybody can turn to for information and that would be responsible for making public the the, the status of things i guess maybe chris you're looking for an answer um Dwayne? Yeah, I guess it's a little bit out of the purview of the of our working group, but um, uh, but yeah, I mean, if there's any response to that, that'd be great. So, um, first of all, it would be either the Zoning Board of Appeals or the uh, Planning Board who would uh, grant a land use permit for one of these installations. Um, the Inspection Services Department inspects projects while they're being constructed. Um, Either one of those land use boards can require um, third party review um, from an outside consultant, either during construction or afterwards. Um, they can also require um, reporting um, on certain, um, you know, at certain intervals. Um, so those things are all could be part of the bylaw that we require these things to happen. The monitoring, we can require that to happen. Um, we don't have any ability to tell inspection services how to do their job, but they would ordinarily inspect projects as they are going along. But the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board, whoever is the land use board, um, would have an ability to um, require third party review on a specific case. So that wouldn't necessarily be written into the bylaw. It's already in the zoning board and planning board rules and regulations that they can require that. And that would be on a case by case basis where they would say, we really feel like this project needs monitoring third party review during construction and also afterwards. So does that answer your question? Yeah. And I, th and I think from the uh, the Hickory Ridge, I think that our, our assistant town manager, Dave Zomack, is, the, is really the person who's been following it. And I think the answer to Michael Lipinski might be that uh, he might want to inquire to Dave Zomack if he has concerns about the project. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, yeah, Janet. Um, I completely admire that these um, meetings really end in time, but I'm beginning to wonder if we might need to add a, a half, here's my unpopular suggestion. I wonder if we could add a half hour. So it'd be, I'm sure Aaron Jakes could have just talked for 20 minutes or I think our workload is gonna get heavier um, and through the spring. So I know people look really enthusiastic 
<laughs> but I just I just want to put that out there not to decide now, but we might, you know, just to get things moving along, because I'm, I'm interested in hearing information about farmlands and forests and, you know, things like that. And I, I yeah. need the content, but we also need the bylaw. Yeah, I, I'll just chime in real quick and say that I, my, you know, I, I vote for being more efficient. It's going to be very hard for me to take more time out um, for these meetings. So I think two hours every other week should be adequate if we're doing reading um, in advance um, and coming with questions. But, you know, I, I just, for me, it's going to be very difficult. Also, I just a hope to get information earlier. I know, Stephanie, you're, you know, post holiday and under the gun, but, um, you know, the week before would be fantastic, but a few days before it is helpful too. But um, I send it when I get it though, Janet. And I um, sometimes I'm waiting on information. So, and the holidays did really set us back quite a bit. So, yeah, I know. I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I'm just kind of like, begging. I know. I, <laughs> I know. I'm just, I mean, that's partly yeah. on all of you as well. You know, that if you are assigned something that you do need to get it to me ahead of time because um like i said some of this information i literally received yesterday so mm -hmm. i'm not getting you know and again i think the hol holidays always set us back that that's always just a common um frustration <laughs> that unfortunately we get the items very yeah, short notice yeah, I'd, I'd be inclined to, let's stick with the two hours i think it, as we get into uh crunch time uh we can reconsider if we want to go longer uh, okay. But for for, for now, people in town that might be interested, are each individually supposed to call them and say, "Hey, hey what's happening?" Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. But let's. Um, we have three minutes left. So, with was there any um, final uh, thoughts or comments? Uh, we'll uh, again. We'll we'll meet. Uh, and absolutely, Martha. The the um, the 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 um, the priority was for GZA. Uh, to to um, review the survey and the and the engagement activities, um, that was a sure thing. Uh, I think the idea of, of uh, postponing Aaron for another two weeks uh, will um, buy us some time. We'll work efficiently um, and get into into um, the language that um, Chris has drafted um, for for today, as well as anything else that might be available for next time. Uh, we'll spend time on that as well. Okay. Anything else before we um, adjourn? Great. Well, enjoy the rest of the day. I don't have a window in this room, but I don't know if it's still snowing or not. Uh, but enjoy that. Um, <laughs> it is snowing. Oh, yeah. Good. Okay. Well, you. Yeah. Okay. Well. I, yeah, I don't have a window here either, so <laughs> I sympathize with you, Dwayne. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, enjoy, and uh, we'll see uh, see everybody back in, in in two weeks. Thank you very much. Bye, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.